Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about the central factors in neuromuscular fatigue. Um, so motor neuron activity during sustained contractions gradually decreases in maximal sustained contractions um, and gradually increases in submaximal sustained contractions. Uh, so in maximal sustained contractions, so we're contracting to the greatest extent, producing the most force possible, we have a gradual decrease in motor neuron activity um, during that contraction. So we have decreased recruitment of motor units. So uh, gradually we have fewer and fewer motor units that are activated and firing rate of the activated motor neurons also decreases. Compared to uh, submaximal sustained contraction, so where we're contracting uh, to a less than maximal degree and we're sustaining that contraction, we have gradually increased recruitment. So we recruit more and more motor, motor units, motor neurons, <laughs> motor units, um, and most of the units that we do recruit have decreasing firing rate. Uh, some of the motor neurons that are recruited later in the, the ongoing sustained contraction uh, will have actually increased firing rates, uh, but the majority that are recruited as we're ramping up that contraction uh, will have decreasing firing rates. Uh, muscle spindle excitation also has a, a significant effect on motor neuron activity. Um, so muscle spindle discharge is an excitatory influence on motor neurons. So muscle spindle cells are running the length of the muscle and they are excited or they discharge when there's a change in length of the muscle. So when the muscle is stretching, the muscle spindle cells are constantly sending feedback to the central nervous system about the length of the muscle and the rate of change of length of the muscle. Um, so when they are, when the muscle spindles discharge, it is excitatory to the motor neurons that are supplying the motor units and the fibers of that muscle. Uh, so that if the muscle spindle is detecting uh, too great of a change in length, so too much stretch of the muscle, or that that stretch is happening too quickly, uh, that we can quickly have a contraction of that muscle to reduce the amount of stretch and protect against uh, injury from stretching too far or too fast. So muscle spindle discharge is excitatory to the muscle that contains those muscle spindles. Um, so muscle spindle discharge actually decreases during submaximal sustained contractions. So the longer we are contracting submaximally, the less often or the lower the frequency of the muscle spindle discharge. And so that's decreasing the excitatory influence of the muscle spindles on that muscle for contraction. Uh, then we also have reciprocal inhibition. So uh, that's where when a muscle is contracting, we, um, we inhibit the reciprocal muscle, so the antagonist muscle, uh, to reduce the amount of co-contraction that we have or co-activation that we have taking place. Uh, we don't want the antagonist to contract to too great of an extent that it interferes with the action of the agonist. Um, so earlier in our sustained contraction, we have increased reciprocal inhibition. And then as we go on in our sustained contraction and the muscles starting to become fatigued, we have less and less reciprocal inhibition so that we have increased coactivation, which helps to reduce oscillations between the agonist and antagonist. Um, so it helps to kind of stabilize and steady the movement um, even though the antagonist might be working against the goal of the movement, um, but it, it still stabilizes against oscillations and instability, which is even worse for the goal of the movement. So it helps sort of smooth out the contraction and smooth out the action uh, by allowing the co-activation of the antagonist and other synergists and so on. Okay, cortical excitation. Um, so what we mean here is the cortical influence of uh, the cerebrum. So where we're planning our um, motor plans in the cerebrum, uh, we have cortical excitation that's producing those motor plans. Um, and that's being contributed to by many different parts of the brain and multiple parts of the cerebrum. 
Uh, but cortical excitation is suboptimal for maximal force generation for as long as a muscle is in a fatigued state. So what we're saying is that while muscles are fatigued, the input or the, the planning, the programming coming from the cerebrum to that muscle is suboptimal. So the cortex is not sending the optimal plan for the greatest uh, force generation from a muscle when that muscle is in a fatigued state. So even if there's rest, so there might be uh, contraction and there's less cortical excitation and then there's rest. And then even when we uh, try to fire that muscle again, there will still be reduced cortical excitation as long as there is uh, muscle fatigue in the, the muscle itself. Um, so that implies that there is feedback coming back from the afferent neurons, um, coming from the muscle spindles, coming from nociceptors and, and other types of uh, receptors that are sending that information from the periphery up to the brain so that the brain knows this muscle is still in a fatigued state and we shouldn't send the, uh, the output to, to generate a maximal force generation from that muscle. Uh, during lasting submaximal exercise, okay, so we're not at a maximal contraction, but for ongoing less than maximal exercise, um, these the conditions listed here affect cortical function and contribute to central fatigue, which significantly decreases performance. Okay, so when we are going through lasting submaximal exercise, over time, we experience decreased blood glucose, increased core temperature, our hormone levels change, and sometimes we undergo hyperventilation. And when we hyperventilate, um, we blunt cerebral blood flow. So with hyperventilation, we protect the brain from the hyperventilation by reducing blood flow to the cerebrum. Uh, but then as that blunted cerebral flow continues, then we actually have decreased oxygen delivery. Okay, so all of these states, the blood glucose, the core temperature, hormones, and hyperventilation, all essentially decrease the, the performance and the function of the cerebral cortex where we're generating the motor programming to go out to the muscles. Um, so those conditions affect that cortical function and contribute significantly to central fatigue, which decreases physical performance and translates to full body fatigue, essentially, or the sensation of full body fatigue and muscle fatigue. Okay, rotation of motor units. Um, so this has been demonstrated in multiple studies, but it is not clear at all how or why this happens or how we might be able to train or manipulate this so that we can use it to our advantage. Uh, so it's not at all clear what is actually going on. Um, but the idea of rotation of motor units, it's the rotation of which motor units are recruited at any given time so that we're recruiting fresh motor units um, and replacing and like rather than recruiting motor units that have already been activated and might be more fatigued. So it's the idea that we're rotating which motor units we're recruiting so that we're offsetting fatigue by giving the different motor units rest in between and recruiting fresh motor units instead. Um, so there is experimental evidence of this, uh, but only during low intensity sustained contractions. Um, and this has not been demonstrated in uh, higher intensity contractions and or maximal contractions. That doesn't mean that it's not happening, um, but the research here is limited and it hasn't been uh, demonstrated sufficiently that we can even figure out why this is happening or conclusively say that it actually is happening. Uh, but there is evidence that it probably is at least at low intensity uh, sustained contraction. All right. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.